Well, early in the, uh, the civil rights movement, before he was really well known, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. went to, uh, to Montgomery, Alabama to participate in the, bu- the bus boycotts that were going on there. This happened shortly after Rosa Parks had refused to sit in the, the colored section of the bus. And, and as King began to participate, this, this bus boycott went on for a long time. It went on and on and on. And, and the longer it went, the more death threats that he began to get. He began to get all, all kinds of these death threats, and, and he really began to worry about what was going to happen to him, but, but even more so, he was worried about the lives of his wife and, and his daughter. And so on January the 27th, 1956, when all this was going on, he couldn't fall asleep that night. So he got up, it's, he tells, and, and he made a pot of coffee, and he just sat down to spend some quiet time with God. Later on in one, of, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in one of his sermons, he explained what happened that night. Here's what, he, here's what he said in that sermon. He said, and I bowed down over that cup of coffee. I will never forget it. He said, I prayed a prayer, and I prayed out loud that night. I said, Lord, I'm down here trying to do what's right. But, Lord, I must confess that I'm weak now. I'm faltering. I'm losing my courage And it seemed at that moment that I could hear an inner voice saying to me, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. And lo, I will be with you even until the end of the world. Now I'm going to come back in just a few moments and I'm going to to kind of explain to you why I began with that story this morning. It will make a little more sense at the time. But what I want to do before I do that is I want, to, I want to spend a little bit of time kind of giving you some background to this new sermon series that we're going to begin this morning. It's a sermon series called Transform, Incorporating the Practices of Jesus. And this sermon series really grew um, over time. It really began, I think, last year. I read a book that I've shared this with you before, a book called Renovating the Heart by a guy named Dallas Willard. And probably other than the Bible itself, that book has had more influence in my life as a, as a disciple of Jesus Christ than almost anything else that I've ever read. And the premise of that book was that, that what we need to do is not to focus so much on outward parts of our life, but to, to begin to focus on developing the inner parts of our life. And so last year, Ryan and I kind of put this on the schedule and and to be real honest, I've probably been more excited about this sermon series than any that I've done in, in quite a long time because I think it, it has the potential to really transform our lives and to help us to become more like Jesus. I know we all want to do that. I also learned during this time that, that probably for much, much of my life and even in my preaching, I've been much more focused at times on on external things than really trying to build up the inner self, or as as Willard puts it, renovating my heart. But you know, if you think about it, the Bible from cover to cover, what it teaches is that if we want to change our outward behavior, what we have to do is begin by changing our hearts, by developing the, the inner man. And this is really true in both the Old and the New Testament. So let me just share with you just a a few verses that I think make that really clear. We're going to start with Proverbs. And in the Proverbs, here's what it says. It says, to keep your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. What the, the, what the, the writer of the, the Proverbs is saying is develop your heart because when you do that, everything else flows out from that. How about Jesus? Here's what, here's what Jesus said in Luke as he was speaking. He said, for no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. Go to the next slide there. For each tree is known by its own fruit, for figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor grapes picked from a bramble bush. And here's the really important part of what he says here. He says the good person out of the good treasure of his what? His heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart... His mouth speaks. 
And then there's this familiar verse from Romans chapter 2. We, we share this one a lot. I think it's really an appropriate verse. And here's what Paul wrote to the churches in, in Rome there. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which is also really another word for the heart there, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, there's something really important about that, that verb be transformed there. You'll notice that it's, it's a passive, what we call a passive verb. He's not saying transform yourself. He says you have to be transformed, that there has to be something or someone who comes along in your life and works on you from the outside that begins that work of transformation in your life. I believe he's clearly talking there about the Holy Spirit. And what we're going to see in this series is that the Holy Spirit wants to come into our lives. He wants to transform us from the inside out. But he has to have something to work with, right? And that's why we're going to talk about these things called spiritual disciplines. I like to refer to them as the, the practices of Jesus, what Jesus did while he was here on this earth. We, we sometimes kind of bristle at the word discipline, right? That's not something that we're all real fond of sometimes, but that's okay. And we're going to talk about these spiritual disciplines, and what we're going to find is these spiritual disciplines or these, these practices of Jesus, that they're tools that the Holy Spirit uses us uses in our life to help to begin to transform us from the inside out, to make us more and more like Jesus. Now, we know that, that about 2,000 years ago, Jesus told his disciples, he said, follow me, right? And he says the same thing to us today. He still says to us today, follow me. But exactly how are we to do that? And, and that's really what this sermon series is all about. How do we, in our day-to-day -day life, how do we incorporate these practices of Jesus into our lives so that we can better follow him, so we can become more and more like Jesus? Because that's really the goal, right? And it begins by being transformed from the inside out. But God uses these spiritual disciplines. He uses these practices of Jesus to do that. And we're going to see this morning that, that Jesus incorporated these practices into his life. And if Jesus needed to do it, just think how much more we need to do that, right? So how, what does it mean to follow Jesus? I'm going to ask you two questions that I think will help us to, to kind of get to the, really, to the heart of that matter. And feel free to answer out loud. It's a two-question two, uh, quiz. You can answer out loud if you want, or you can just... Think the answer to yourself, and then later on you can tell all your friends, well, I really had it right, but I just didn't want to say it out loud. So um, so here's, here's the first question. How many times in the Bible do you think the word Christian is found? Take a guess. Zero, one, actually three. The real answer is three. Three times, all in the New Testament. And at least two of the three times, it was used by outsiders to refer to those who followed Jesus Christ, and it wasn't always a real nice term. You know, those guys, those Christians. So three times. Okay, here, here's the, the tougher one. You guys were all at least close, right? Anything from zero to one, you were at least close to three. How many times in the New Testament do you think the word disciple is found? A hundred 12, there, there we go, the perfect number, 12, 7, right, 7, the perfect number. You guys are really cold on this one. 268 times, 268 times, all in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. It's the only time you'll find that word disciple. Usually Jesus refer, uses it to refer to those who follow him. And why is that important? A lot of reasons, but here's, here's why I think it's really, really important. And that is, there's no such thing as a Christian who's not a disciple. Let me repeat that. There's no such thing as a Christian who's not a disciple. I think, unfortunately, over the years, a lot of Christians get this idea that there's almost like two classes of Christians, right? There's like the normal Christian, and then there's the super Christian who's a disciple of Jesus. Not true. We're all to be disciples of Jesus Christ, every single one of us. And if that's the case, then it's probably 
a good thing for us to define what a disciple is. Would you agree? We ought to know what that is. And probably you've heard a lot of definitions over the years. Most of the time a disciple is, is defined as a pupil or a learner, but I think it's actually much more than that. Here's the definition of disciple that I want us to use this morning. It comes from the Greek word methetes, which guess what English word we get from that? Math. But it, what it really speaks to is that someone who adopts the lifestyle of the teacher. It's more than just getting a whole bunch of information. Jesus, when he called us to be disciples, he wasn't just saying, I want you to learn a bunch of information. He says, I want you to follow me in a way that you actually adopt my lifestyle. And that's why these practices of Jesus that we're going to be talking about in this sermon series are so important. Because that's how we adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. Now, I really like Dallas Willard in the book that I mentioned to you before, and also one of my other favorite authors, John Mark Comer. They refer to this idea of discipleship as being an apprentice of Jesus. I love that idea. Now, we don't have a whole lot of apprentices so much in our in our culture anymore, but if you go into one of the trades, like if you're a, an electrician or a plumber or something like that, what do you do? You start out as an apprentice, and what do you do? You go out with the, the master electrician or the master plumber, and you watch them work, and then you begin to do it a little bit by yourself, and you have them watch you and correct you and guide you, and that's really what being a disciple of Jesus is like. We're to be apprentices of Jesus. I think that's what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 15 when he talks about abiding in him. That's what we're to do. We're to live our lives day by day in the presence of Jesus, taking on these practices that we're going to talk about so that we can become more and more like him, so that we can adopt his lifestyle. And I think that's, that's what it's all about. So I want to begin this morning with a passage from Luke chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, go ahead. And, and turn there, and I'm going to read the first part of Luke chapter 4 because it's going to kind of set the stage for this entire series and especially for what we're going to look at this morning. So Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. <coughs> Excuse me. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle at the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went, all, went out through all the surrounding country. A lot there, isn't there? But what I want us to see here is that just in this one passage, we see, we see four of the practices that we're going to be talking about. There's probably about, depending on on who you talk to, somewhere around a dozen different spiritual practices or spiritual disciplines that we could engage in. But we're going to focus in this series on, on seven that Jesus did himself and see why they're so important. As I mentioned before, if Jesus thought they were important, they probably should be important to us, right? So there's at least four of them that we see just in this one passage. First one is fasting. I know all of you guys are really looking forward to that sermon, right? We couldn't do it today with the potluck, so we're going to put that off for a few more weeks. So, And you will learn about fasting. I know you guys are really excited about putting into practice fasting, right? We're, next week, we're going to look at prayer. We see Jesus praying here. Third thing we see is Jesus uses Scripture, and we're going to talk about how we can use Scripture in our life and how we can meditate on it and, and memorize it and study and all the things we can do with Scripture. And then finally, 
the one you probably figured out that we're going to talk about today, and that's solitude. And that's where the story that I shared with you earlier comes in, the story of Martin Luther King, Jr. On that night, on January the 27th of 1956, he sat down in solitude at that table because he wanted to hear the voice of God. But I want you to imagine with me for just a a few moments what that might have looked like had that occurred today. Think about that. When he sat down, when he couldn't sleep, what if instead he'd had a smartphone at his disposal? And he picked up that smartphone, and he began to scroll through his Facebook feed. And then he pulled out his computer and got on the Internet and began to, to look at all the news feeds and began to fume over the news reports that were there. And then maybe when he couldn't sleep, he he decided he'd go ahead and binge watch one of his favorite TV series for a while. How about let's make it even more personal? How's your walk with God? Are you spending quiet time with Him? In a world that's full of smartphones and streaming services and, and computers and noise and in all kinds of things, how well are you doing? How well are you doing at it, it, it bringing solitude into your life? See, for Jesus, as he began his earthly ministry, what did he do? He went out and he spent 40 days in solitude. It was so important from him to hear from his father, to know what the father wanted from his life, that he spent 40 days in solitude. 40 days. And look what happened at the end of that time. Look what the result of that. Let's go back and look at verse 14. I want to go back and look at that again because here's what it says. It says, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. He spent 14 days hearing from God, listening to God, fighting against the devil, but mostly just listening to God. This temptation is only one small part of that 40 days he spent out there. And because of that, guess what? The Holy Spirit was ena- was enabled to pour his power into the life of Jesus. Now, Jesus was still 100% God as well as 100% man, but we know from the Scriptures that while he was here on this earth that he willingly chose to give up some of the powers that he had as God. That's what it talks about in Philippians chapter 2 where it says that Jesus emptied himself. And so he needed the Holy Spirit to come in and, and to empower him in his life. And the main way he did that is through solitude. And so that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of the time this morning. Now, this is probably a good time to to identify what solitude is. And this is really our main idea that we're going to pursue today as well. Here's what solitude is. It's the intentional, temporary withdrawal from social engagement for spiritual purposes. I want to talk about a couple of those things. Notice, first of all, it's intentional. I'm going to talk to you in just a moment about taking advantage of these, these times that we have throughout the day where we might have some solitude, but, but it needs to be more than that. That's a good start, but we need to plan for these times in our life. It needs to be intentional, and we see in Jesus' life that it was exactly that. There's a, there's a rhythm to Jesus' life. You see it over and over again. We'll look at this in just a moment. He has these times of ministry, and then he goes away, and he gets away for intentional times that he can get alone with God in a quiet place. Secondly, it's temporary. So if you're an an introvert like me, this is not an excuse to go off and just isolate yourself and get away from people. We just got done going through a sermon series in Ephesians where, where we taught, where Paul wrote about the importance of being within the body of Christ and about the importance of personal relationships and developing our character and becoming more like Jesus. So So this is not an excuse to do that. And finally, it's for spiritual purposes. Not just a time, you know, if you're a parent with young kids at home, this isn't just me going off to get a quiet place. It's for spiritual purposes. It's a time when we lay our lives out before God and and say, God, here I am, warts and all, speak to me. Tell me what you want to do in my life. And that's what Jesus did. He had this rhythm to his life where he does that over and over. And I'm going to take you through a real quick tour through the Gospels to to just demonstrate that. The first time we see that this is in the book of Matthew. Here's what it says there. Matthew 14, 23. It says, and after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. 
And when evening came, he was there alone. It was solitude. You know what day that was? That was the day that he'd fed thousands of people with the loaves and the fish. Pretty busy day, right? Probably the miracle witnessed by more people at one time than any of the other miracles he did. And it would have been really tempting for Jesus to kind of like hang around and get all the accolades for that, right? That's what we would do. But what does he do instead? He goes up on a mountain by himself so that he can pray. We see this also in, in Mark's gospel as well, Mark chapter 1. It says, and I know a lot of you really love this verse, and rising very early in the morning, great verse, huh? I know you guys are all really into that, right? Rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, that's even better, huh? He departed and went out to a desolate place where he prayed. That word desolate place is really interesting. It's the same word, Greek word that's translated wilderness back in Luke chapter 4, the, the passage we read at the very beginning this morning. Then we go on to a, another passage here in Luke that describes this same day that was described there in Mark. It says this, And when it was day, he departed and went to a desolate place. So he gets away. And then finally, this one from Luke, and I think this one is really uh, instructive to us, the last one that we're going to look here, at here. It says this, But now even more the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. That, that verb, would, would withdraw, it's a present tense verb. It means this was his normal practice. He didn't just do it this day. He did it day after day. Matter of fact, some of the other um, translations that you read, contemporary translations will translate this, he would often withdraw to desolate places. That was what he did time after time. So I hope you've seen from the life of Jesus this morning this idea that we talked about that solitude is this intentional, temporary withdrawal from social engagement so that we can... For, for spiritual purposes. Now, one of the things that, that Ryan and I wanted to do in this sermon series is to make it really, really practical for all of us. And so we're going to try to do that. We're going to try to give you some concrete things that you can do to incorporate these practices into your life. So with a, a few minutes that we have remaining, I want to talk about how is it that we can incorporate solitude into my life. And I'm going to share with you five things that we can do that will help us to do that. Number one, you need to start small. Start small. I, I know some of you are really tempted when you start something new, you want to ju jump in, you know, with both feet, right? Kind of reminds me of some people that, that I've seen over the years, you know, they decide they're going to go to the gym. And the first day at the gym, they get on the treadmill and they go for an hour. And then they lift weights for another couple of hours, and then they're so sore and tired, they never go back to the gym again. So don't do that. Don't do that with this. Start small. Maybe just five to ten minutes of solitude where you can get away and, and spend some time with Jesus. Sometimes it means maybe just taking advantage of the little solitudes that come to you during the day. It could be something as simple as just when you're on your way driving to work, turn off your radio. Turn off your cell phone and just spend some time listening to God, talking to God. It could be something like that. So start small. Don't try to make it too big. Number two, think subtraction, not addition. You know what most of us do? We want to do something else in our life. We're going to like, well, I'll just add one more thing to my busy schedule. And it doesn't work very well, does it? I, I'm convinced that every one of us probably has some things. If you're not including solitude with God, in your life. There's some things in your life that are not nearly as important that you can take out of your calendar, out of your life, so that you can make time to spend time in solitude with God. So simplify things. Don't make them more complicated. The third thing that we can do is to find or develop quiet places. That's what Jesus did. I, I get this idea from reading the gospel accounts that he had kind of like some go-to places. When he needed to get alone, he had some places where he would go. You guys may have some places. For me, one of, my, one of my places is on the trails at Catalina State Park. Most of the time I hike with Mary and enjoy that, but, you know, sometimes I just love going out and hiking a trail by myself and just, like, listen as I'm walking. Spend 45 minutes or an hour walking one of the trails, just talking to God, maybe singing songs of praise to Him 
listening to him. You may have some other place. But you also maybe need to develop, most of us need to develop a place, probably within our homes because we spend most of our time there. But it needs to be a place where you're not going to get distracted. Most of the time when I'm reading my Bible, when I'm doing Bible studies, when I'm preparing sermons, I'm doing it on my computer or on my smartphone. That's not going to be solitude because I'm going to be having emails pop in and all kinds of other stuff. So when I want to get time alone, I get my paper Bible out, go find a quiet place in my home where I'm not going to be disturbed. So find or develop a quiet place. Establish a rhythm of solitude. Build it into your life. Start with a daily time. Start with three minutes if you want to, five minutes. But build it into your life on a daily basis, just this time that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get away with God. And then try to have some longer times, maybe once a week. And, and you're not going to do this all at once. Remember I said start small, but think about the big picture. Here's where I want to get in the long term. Maybe once a week I spend 30 minutes alone with God. Maybe that's on Sunday morning before. Before you come to church, you get up early, well, very early in the morning while it was still dark like Jesus did, and you spend 30 minutes. Or maybe you do it on Sunday afternoon when you get home from church. And then think about even in the longer term, maybe once or twice or three times a year, try to get away for, for a few hours or a half a day or maybe even a day just to get a quiet place. But build that rhythm into your schedule. Put it down on your schedule and, and don't Schedule anything else when you have that time. Guard that time. Finally, remember the J curve. And this is going to be good advice for every single one of these practices that we're going to talk about. Now, how many of you know what the J curve is? I didn't until this week either. So here's a picture of a J curve. And what a J curve tells us is that when we're learning something new, at the very beginning, we're going to probably get worse at it before we get better. I can testify that. I've done a lot of things in my life. I remember take, the first time I took golf lessons. I went out and tried to play golf, and I was horrible. But as I incorporated the things that the, that the instructor told me, and as I began to practice them, as I had some discipline to incorporate those into my golf game, guess what? Over time... My game got better. And the same thing is going to be true with solitude. You know what? The first time you do it, you're going to be nervous. You're going to be anxious. You're going to be thinking, is my time up yet? But just stick with it. I promise it will get better. So we've seen this morning that, that solitude is the intentional, temporary withdrawal from social engagement for spiritual purposes. And I'm gonna, I want to help you to put this into practice this morning as we close our time. So we're going to do things a little bit differently as we, as we close our time this morning. I'm convinced that all of us can do at least one thing. We can take one practical step this week to help us to begin to incorporate this time of solitude into our lives. So I'm going to invite you to do that at the end of the service this morning. In just a few minutes. I'm going to pray. When I, when I, after I pray, the service is yours. It's over. But I want to encourage you to spend some time just in solitude. Shoot. However, you can do whatever you want. I'd say shoot for three minutes. If you can do that, some, for some of you, that'll seem like an eternity. Feel free to find, if you need to, to find a different spot somewhere if this is too noisy for you. Go outside, probably not, right? 100 degrees probably already out there. But if, if that's what you want to do, just send some time and say, God, I just want to lay my life over before you. Go ahead and speak to me. Show me how you want me to incorporate this practice of solitude into my life. And then I'd encourage you to write down whatever God would lay on your heart as you do that. So, so we're going to do that. Once you're done with that, the food will get set up over there. You can go over and we'll enjoy some fellowship together. I'll pray for our food as well before we do that. And just enjoy some fellowship with each other. So everyone got it? Any questions? I know this is going to be really uncomfortable for some of you, even three minutes of solitude if we're not used to it. But this is really important. I'd like to close this morning with a quote from Mother Teresa that I think really reminds us of the importance 
of this sol- incorporating solitude into our lives. Here's, here's what she said. Tyler, if you can go to the next. There we go. It says, we need to find God, and he cannot be found in noise and restlessness. God is the friend of silence. I want you to think about how well, how much better God can take and transform your life from the inside out if you'll find those times of silence. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for wanting us to become more like Jesus. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who lives inside of us and desires to transform us and to make us more like Jesus. Father, I know for a lot of us this whole idea of solitude is kind of scary because we live in a world that's just so full of noise. But, Father, it's so important, as we've seen today. So just help each one of us to be able to to take and incorporate this into our lives in an appropriate way. Father, I know it will look different for each one of us, and that's fine. But just help us to do that. So, Father, in these next few moments, would you just speak to each one of us as you desire? And then as you do that, Father, we thank you for the ability that we have to gather together and just enjoy some fellowship around the food that's been prepared. We pray that you bless that time, bless those who have prepared the food. And, Father, may that also, may that time also be used by you to make us more like Jesus. For it's in his name that we pray.